Well, we do bring you greetings in the name of Jesus Christ from New Zion Tabernacle. We are the church seeking the heart of God and sharing it with the world. It is our pleasure to minister the word of the Lord to you today. We thank God for a spirit that dwells in us that gives us the ability both to hear and to speak the mind of God. And so we thank God for you this afternoon. We give God glory, honor, and praise for the opportunity to share the word of God. I also want to honor our associate pastors, Pastor George and Pastor Kelly. I thank God for them and all the elders, and of course, Minister Desmond, who was here with us today, helping with our taping session. So I thank God for that opportunity as well. He's just a mighty God. And today, just excuse me, because my heart is just so full of thanksgiving for the goodness and the greatness of our God. I give him praise today. He is a mighty God, and I declare, and I know it for myself, that there is none like him. So let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you today for your goodness and for your kindness. You are a mighty God. Oh, God, we give you praise for life and life itself. We thank you for the things that you give us to enjoy. We thank you, oh God, for the relationships that you have established in the earth realm to do ministry with us, oh God. We give you praise right now, Lord, because the open door is before us. We praise you, Father, oh God, for the abundance and for the harvest. We thank you for divine wisdom and understanding. We thank you, oh God, for the strategies of the kingdom, oh God, that you're releasing to us even right now. God, I pray, Lord, that everyone that hears these words today, everyone, oh God, that is able to sense the spirit of the receptive of the word of God, oh God, that you expand it in our capacity, oh God, enlarge our capacity right now in the name of Jesus, increase us, oh God, give us a new dimension of you, Lord, we thank you, Father, right now in Jesus' name that you have set before us, oh God, good plans, plans to get us to the expected end, God, there's a place you expect us to be, so Father, help us to be there, help us to get there, help us to abide there, help us to worship you there, help us to work there and accomplish your divine purposes. So we pray for the city of Fort Wayne. We pray for our nation. We pray, oh God, for all of our elected officials. We pray, Father, for everyone that has a voice over our livelihood. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, lead them, Father, in the way everlasting. God, let your will be done in our time today and help us, Father, to always remember that you alone, or oh Lord, and beside you, Father, there is none other. And we give you praise for it. We thank you, oh God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Oh, we give God the praise right now. We just thank him. There's no God like Jehovah. Hallelujah. I need you to feel that today. I need you to hear it. I need to sense it. I need us to live it today that there's no God like Jehovah. I just thank God for New Zion. I thank God for all of you and all those that continue to give generously to the heart of our ministry. Remember, you can access Givelify or NewZionTabernacle.org at any time. And not just through this telecast, but at any time. God lays us on your heart. We appreciate every seed that is sown. It is a time now to hear God like never before. I do declare I've never seen times like these before. But I thank God today for his goodness and his wonderful works into the children of men of which we are called to do this work in the kingdom. Well, today we're going to talk about getting involved part three. We've talked about part one and part two, and you can archive those also on YouTube if you choose to. So you'll be right caught up with just what we need to be for today. But today we're going to talk about how we can get involved in another dimension. And that, that is in the dimension of prayer and fasting. And for our foundational text today, actually we have two of them. One is Isaiah 58, which we'll go to in just a moment. But I want us to begin our journey today in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 9. And I'll be reading today from the New Living Translation. So whenever I switch translations, I'll always let you know because I want you to stay with us. So today we are reading from the New Living Translation. It is St. Mark, chapter 9. And I want to kind of skip around with some of the verses, but I will tell you where we are. First of all, verse 14 kind of begins this section, this whole narrative, and it reads as follows. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, they being the, the disciples that were selected to go with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw them as some of the teachers of the religious law, and they were arguing 
when they saw when they saw the crowd, Jesus knew that they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to meet him. As they saw Jesus, they couldn't wait to get to him, and so they ran to meet him. But Jesus was in tune now with their arguing, and he asked the question, what is all this arguing about? You know, it sounds like my dad sometimes. He would walk in if we were having a crossword with each other, and he'd walk in. He'd want to know what was going on. So Jesus says, what is this all arguing all about? One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so that you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Ooh, that sounds serious. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Wow, bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy to Jesus. Verse number 21, how long has this been happening? Jesus asked. He replied, since he was a little boy, imagine all of this time this young man has gone through these kinds of spiritual conniptions. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. And he's talking now to the onlookers as well. And the father just cries out. He says, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And as Jesus noticed the crowd all around him, he said, listen, you spirit who makes this boy unable to hear and speak. Ooh, Jesus, the spirit that makes us unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. And the spirit left the boy. And then the disciples were perplexed. How was it that we weren't able to cast the spirit out of the boy? And in verse 29, Jesus says, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. And in some translations, it can only be cast out with prayer and fasting. And so Mark chapter 9 talks about several things, but today we're talking about this difficult demon. Sometimes we face things that we've never faced before that challenge us, that all of our best efforts prove that we're not able to overcome this aspect of adversity. And when I think about the demon of injustice, the demon of racism, it is a difficult demon that always seems to raise its head. We've been fighting this demon for a long time, for years, for years, for decades, for centuries, yet we still find ourselves fighting this same demon. It just begins to surface over and over and over again in different kinds of ways sometimes, but still a difficult demon to deal with. And that was the account in our text today, the difficult demon. And as I was praying, I said, God, you know, what strategy do you want us to use that maybe we haven't used yet? What else can we do? What can we do differently? And I'm not saying that we've not spent time in prayer and fasting because many of us have, but I believe that the text today will give us a new dimension of our responsibility as believers to pray and also fast as we combat the ills of our society. And so there was an argument that Jesus kind of walks up on. And they were arguing with the disciples. The scribes and Pharisees were arguing with the disciples about their inabilities. And when I think about the role of the church, and sometimes the church comes under criticism about why we're not doing this or why we're not doing that, about the inability of the church to move the, the community in a certain direction, the inability of us to be able to provide food or resources or shelter for those that need it because we know that we operate with limited supplies. And so here they were arguing about my inability. And you know how it is sometimes when people have attacked you because of something that you can't do, you feel in your own heart that you're doing the best you can, that you're trying to provide the need, you're trying to be the best preacher, the best pastor, the, the best deacon, the best elder, the best 
psalmist, uh, the best member, you're doing the best you can, yet somebody still is able to identify an area now of inability. So it becomes a place of attack. It becomes a personal attack. The disciples took this attack personally. And it's interesting too, because the scribes were complaining about what the disciples couldn't do, yet you don't read anywhere in the text where the, dis where the scribes were doing something to help the situation either. And that's just the way complainers are. They get their joy just in complaining. They're not doing anything to solve the problem, but they get just that euphoria feeling when they find themselves now complaining one thing after the other. They were only interested now in helping themselves. They did nothing to solve the problem, but they complained about the disciples that at that time were giving what they felt like was their best effort. You see, this father had brought his son to the disciples, and he just was confident that the disciples could cast the demon out. And you might say, well, what made him that confident? I'm sure they knew that he, they had been with Jesus. And there ought to be something about our community when we're out in, in the neighborhoods that people can tell that there's just something about our countenance, something about our speech or the way we carry ourselves that lets someone else know that we have been with Jesus. And I am sure that this man knew that Jesus could cast demons out of individuals, that he could set people free, that he could heal the sick, he could raise the dead, he could open the eyes of the blinded. We know that the miraculous power of Jesus Christ was no secret even back in those days. But here we now have this young man that was just possessed. And he, he couldn't talk. He couldn't hear. He couldn't speak. And the seizures would throw him to the ground. And he would have all kinds of rigidity movements in his body. And he would begin to grind his teeth. And he would foam at the mouth. And just imagine how this father felt year after year, not being able to find an answer or getting deliverance for his beloved son. Even though the disciples have been given authority by Jesus Christ, check out Mark chapter 6 and verse number 7. He said, I give you authority over all the power of the devil. I give you authority to cast out demons. And so Jesus has this authority in his own possession, and now he releases that authority to his disciples. I believe that even today, Jesus is still releasing his authority to us, and it is progressive based upon us. It's all the power that God. God gives, he never gives us part of him, but there's a responsibility that we as people of God have that when God gives us authority to be able to manage and navigate that authority effectively, not to abuse our power, not to abuse our authority, not to take authority and Lord over somebody else, but to use that authority to set the captives free. And so God had given them that authority to cast out demons, yet today in our text there was something missing. There was something that was hindering the disciples from using effectively the authority that Jesus had given. You see, they're using that authority, but when we use the authority effectively, it always yields now in results. And the, the disciples wanted to see the results. This dad wanted the results. The scribes were waiting for the results, but there were no results now being evidenced by the work of the disciples. And so what does Jesus say to all of them? He says to the scribes, to the father. He says this to the disciples. He said, you unbelieving generation. He calls them faithless. Ah, and so the father just speaks up and he says, if you can do anything, that if now refers to the faith that the father had. So now he brought the disciples uh, to be healed. He brought the disciples to have the demon cast out, yet did he have the faith to believe, really believe it could be done? Because now when he becomes face to face with Jesus, he asks the question, if you can do anything. Jesus is saying, what? What do you mean if I can do anything? But he was revealing to Jesus his measure of faith. You see, our if in every circumstance has nothing to do with Jesus because he is well able to do everything that he has promised. But the if has to do with our faith. Do we really believe that Jesus can answer the questions? Do we believe that he can give us the strategies? Do we believe that he can heal the sick? Do we believe that he can make a way out of no way? Do we believe that he can create doors and make doors? Do we believe he can deliver our children from drug addiction? Do we believe that he can open up the doors of salvation? 
salvation? Do we believe in the area of our finances that he can cause us to prosper and be in health as our soul prospers? Do we really believe the promises that Jesus has said to us about our lives? And so this man comes to Jesus and they're having the conversation and he said, if you can do anything. So he's doubting in his own mind what Jesus can do. But let me tell you, church, there is no doubt in Christ. Christ is confident about everything that he can do for us. He gives us promises and sometimes he gives us the, the if then promises. If you do this, I'll do this. If you humble yourselves, if you pray, then I'll heal the land. If you turn from your wicked ways, I'll heal the land. Sometimes he gives us a part to play in our own solutions, in the results of our own problems. God wants us to know today that there's no doubt in Christ. He is confident. He wants us to be confident in him, but he can do just what he said he's going to do. If he couldn't do it, he wouldn't have said it. But there's no limit to the power of Jesus Christ. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere present. And because he's everywhere present, he is everywhere powerfully present. He is the mighty God and there is none like him. He is the mighty God. And he lets us know that our faith now must be in him. So, so whatever they were doing or whatever they were saying to Jesus, there was no faith activating his movement. Sometimes because of where we are spiritually, even though we know the words to say, there's no faith that activates movement. We can lay hands on the sick and they not recover. And it's not always because of a lack of faith, but oftentimes we don't really believe him to move anyway. And when he does move, everybody's shocked. Ooh, what? What happened? Look what Jesus just did. And we begin to talk to uh, our neighbors and we call somebody and tell them of the marvelous works of our Christ. But Jesus is always doing wonderful works. Marvelous are his works. He's always blessing his people. He's always doing something that's praiseworthy. But he wants us to know of assuredly that when I say something, I am able to do it. And if I give you authority to do something, you're well able to do it, but it must always be done God's way. Let me tell you, whatever we do for the Father, there's a method that God gives us. He not only tells us what to do, but as we continue to hear him, he tells us how to do it. I shudder to think what would have happened to Isaac if Abraham had not continued to listen. Okay, he got the command to take him to Mount Moriah. He takes him up there, but he's still listening to God. He puts him on the altar, but he's still listening to God. He ties him down, but he's listening to God. He gets the wood, but he's listening to God. And then all of a sudden, just at the point that he has a knife in his hand, because he's still listening, he hears God say, don't lay a hand on the child. And he was able to see now the ram caught in the thicket. What am I saying? Oh, hallelujah. Hear me, church, today that when God gives us a directive, when God gives us instructions, when he gives us the plan, we must continue to hear God as to how to allow that plan to unfold. Because I believe every step of the way, every step of the journey, God wants us to hear him. God wants to be glorified with every step. And as we praise, as we praise him, okay, there's a praise point when we get to the mountain. There's a praise point when we're building the sacrifice, when we're building the altar. Every step of the way is we're giving God glory, but we're listening to God. God, we just need to hear you. And I declare right now in the name of Jesus that in the midst of all of that's happening in our world with the virus, everything that's happening with the injustice, oh God, and all the discrimination practices, oh God, we know that God wants to move on our behalf and we need to hear from you, Jesus. We need to hear a word from the Lord. And I believe that as we hear a word from the Lord, that one word will get you going. But the next word, get you going further. And the next word gets you going further. You see, it's the word of the Lord that keeps us going, keeps us full of hope, of hope and keeps us moving forward in the name of Jesus. And so Jesus, as he began to talk to the father, uh, the, the whole concept of faith just kind of challenged the father. He probably thought now, okay, he, he said, we're, we're unbelieving. And he didn't say, oh no, Jesus, we're not. He didn't, he didn't debate the mind of Christ. He believed what Jesus was saying. He said, okay, Jesus, I agree with you, but what I want you to do is help me wherever I don't have the belief, help my unbelief. 
I wonder how many of us would have responded like that. We would have said, oh, I believe. I, you know how we get in those prayer circles and you know, we're trying to believe God for something and everybody around the table just agrees. Yeah, we believe, we believe. But you look up and somebody's watching their clock. Is it time to go home yet? You see somebody else's phone is ringing. And so now they're looking at the phone. Yet you believe with me for a miracle. I need a miracle. I need you to put your phone down. I need you to agree in the spirit. I need you to put all the other noises, uh, all the other voices aside. I need you to push stuff away so that we can hear God. We can't even have a prayer meeting without somebody's phone going off. And it's one thing to go off, another one for you to go off and get it. But we go off because we're so easily distracted our ability to concentrate and focus in on the mind of God and that's one reason why we miss so many instructions that God wants to download in our spirit but when Jesus told this father that he didn't believe notice the disciples kept silent because they knew where they were but when this father heard that Jesus was questioning his belief he said okay Jesus then help me Help me to believe like you want me to believe. And that's a challenge I want to put before the church even right now. God, help us to believe you the way you want us to believe. Help us to trust you, oh God, in every area. Help us to be devoted to you. Help us to consecrate our lives in prayer and fasting that we can hear you. And when you say it, God, let us activate. Let us move at your word. I don't know how you're going to work it out, Jesus, but at your word, I'm moving. I don't know how you're going to answer prayer or how you're going to pay this bill but God at your word I'm moving and as God begins to speak more and more the clarity of his voice oh God becomes becomes one with us and we know what when Jesus is speaking and when it's the voice of the enemy and so he asked Jesus okay Jesus I give you that my belief is not where it needs to be so please help my unbelief and then the father and Jesus have another conversation uh, how long has it been like this he's been like this since he was a child He's been like this since he was a boy. You can imagine them trying to take their son different places, but because he was demon possessed, all the manifestations of that of that demonic attack just begin to surface. You know, it's like you you're talking to somebody and you never know what they're going to say next, and it's not always appropriate for the circumstance. And so he had his son for years now suffering from this demonic attack. And so Jesus now looks at the little boy, and when he looks at the boy, he, he recognizes the spirit. Mm. You see, up until now, no one could even recognize what that spirit was. And I think about the spirit of racism, the, the demon of racism. We don't always recognize the demon of racism, even in ourselves. We don't recognize our own prejudices, our own thoughts of isolation and separatism. We don't recognize our own mindset, our own generalizations about culture and about race. We don't truly know ourselves. And how can I say that? Because I'm learning me every day. I'm learning more and more about me and how God wants me to change and how God wants me to think I've not yet arrived. I am still in process. And I believe that as a human race, we're, we're still in process. God's still teaching us and he's still downloading fresh rhema word from heaven into our spirits. And so he identifies the spirit. That's the first thing he does. He, ident he calls it out. You deaf and mute. That means he couldn't hear and he couldn't speak. And sometimes we don't know what to do because we can't hear. Oh, and, and, and our, our mouths are so locked in, in absence and sometimes lack of knowledge. We don't even know what to say. And so the enemy now has kept us quiet when maybe God wanted us to speak and we couldn't speak because we weren't listening. We weren't in tune with the news. We didn't hear it when that, when that newscaster made that comment. We didn't hear it when that comment was was made at the council meeting. We didn't hear it. And because we didn't hear it, we couldn't speak to it. We couldn't address it because we weren't interested, because we weren't involved, because we didn't take the time to find out what the issues were. We didn't hear the three-point plan, so we couldn't speak about it. We couldn't hear the mayor's vision, so we couldn't address it. And so sometimes, because we're not listening, we're not listening to the cry of the mother that's raising her child by herself. Oh, we're not listening to those that are hungry. We're not listening to those that are laying on the streets because they have no other place to lay their head. We're not not listening because we're not hearing them. We're not speaking it. Oh, we know that's happening, but we're not speaking life. We're not speaking success. We're not speaking victory. Oh, so we're deaf and dumb to what's going on all around us. It's a spiritual thing, but Jesus come to loose our mouths. He's come to loose our ears. He's come to loose us that we might hear the mind of God, that the captives might be set free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. 
You see, the devil loves to keep us ignorant, to keep us away from good information. Uh, th that's why you hear folks talking out of both out ways. You know, th this way, is th today it's over here, and today it's over here, and the two are conflicting. Uh, you say one thing today, and you say another thing tomorrow. Or you say one thing, and then you live another. So all these conflicts about who is the real you? Who really are you when it comes to the things of God? And so the devil now wants to keep us blinded from good information. And you know what? Well, I heard the president say this. Well, I heard the president say that. And guess what? The argument now ensues because you're believing one thing about what was said and now somebody else is bringing, be, believing another thing. And so when you're confused about your information, you're reluctant now to speak. That's why it's important for us to hear the mind of God. Hear what God is saying. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's not just a time for the seven churches of, of Revelation. It's a time for the churches in Fort Wayne. The churches in the United States of America to hear what God is saying and believe God. Don't, and if God checks us, just get checked. Uh, you know, there, there are very few days that the Holy Ghost doesn't check me and I just say, okay, he just checked me. I just got checked. And so when God checks me about my level of faith or, or my level of love or the condition of my heart, I've learned and I'm still learning how to receive the check of the Holy Ghost. But also I'm learning how to go to God, repent of that thing and just get it right. Lord, fix me. I want to be right before you, oh God. Oh, I truly want to be the vessel that God has called us to be in these days. In these times, God needs those that will stand for righteousness, that will stand for justice that will cry aloud and spare not, that will pray and fast and believe God for the breakthrough. And so Jesus begins to pray for this young man. Oh, but it doesn't take him a very long time. After all, he is the authority. Not that he's given authority. He is the authority. And he said, I command this spirit to leave and never enter again. Leave this boy and never enter this boy's body again. Loose him so that he can hear. Loose him so he can speak. Loose him so he can actualize his divine potential. And the boy was set free. And the disciples, they weren't even rejoicing that the boy was free. They weren't even rejoicing that here was one that was bound, that was demon possessed. Oh, but now freed by the command of Jesus Christ. Their question was, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we cast him out? What's wrong with us that we couldn't do it? What's wrong with us that the great commission is before us and we're not able to carry out the great commission? Why is it that we can't be the strong, powerful, anointed church to bind the hands of the enemy and let the people go free? The disciples said, Jesus, what's wrong with us? And Jesus reminded them, mm, Yes, you might have prayed, but some things, some things only come by prayer and fasting. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You see, prayer and fasting, it's not like we have to be made worthy because we're already worthy. We're at salvation. At the point of salvation, we were made worthy. But how are we using our power? How devoted are we to God? And it's one thing about prayer and fasting. Now, prayer changes things, changes me for things. But when I layer fasting and begin to push back my plate or begin to push back something that's taking my time or getting me away from the things of God, something happens to my spirit. I begin to prioritize things differently. I begin to do things differently. I became, begin to get more conscious of my time and how I'm using my time. My time in the word, my time in prayer, my commitment to God, my commitment to the community. Prayer and fasting coupled together now give us an expression to God that, Lord, I am totally dependent on you. That there'll be no move, God, if you don't move. And I need you to move in me first. And we need to give the Holy Ghost permission to move in us first. Move in me, Holy Ghost, so that I can move some evil out of my space. Move in me, oh God, so I can lay hands on the sick and they recover. Move in me, oh God, so that I can hear your voice and hear your plan for my life. Move in me, oh God. I've been paying my tithes, oh, but I still got a financial mess. So move in me, oh God, that I might have your financial plan for my life. Let me tell you, Jesus does promise us abundant living, abundant life, but we have to change some habits. But you want to get out of debt, you can't stay at the mall. You can't stay on Amazon.com. You are wherever you shop. You've got to make sure that you're allowing a sense of discipline to come as you begin to reprioritize your desire for material things, but more and more desiring 
the God that we serve. And so we understand that Jesus had given them the authority. But remember this, if you don't remember anything else today, remember this, that, that our authority must be made effective by our faith. There is no authority without faith. The two work together. Jesus gave them the authority, but their faith was weakened. And so when God gives us the authority, which he does, he wants us to couple that with faith. So now how is faith increased? We know that's increased by reading the word. It's increased as we begin to confess the word, affirm the word, as we actually hear the word and not just audibly hearing the word, but I'm talking about hearing the word spiritually, taking the word and allowing the word to navigate our lives, taking the word and letting the word lead us everywhere we go, hiding the word in our hearts so we don't sin against God, cleansing our ways. How? By taking heed there to God according to your word. So as we begin to get the word, the word builds faith, spending time in his presence, not just 10 minutes in the morning and five minutes before you go to bed, but taking some quality time with God and watch your devotion for God just change. You'll find yourself trusting him more, but oh, glory to God, believing in him more. Thank you, Jesus. Church, I know what I'm talking about. Oh God, times when I've had to cry out to God and I had to push back my plate. Some things I wanted to enjoy that I thought would just be fun to do, but God wouldn't let me do them because it was time now for him to redirect my mind and to redirect my path. Sometimes not being able to sleep at night because so tormented. Oh God, my things just on my mind and just kind of troubling me. Oh, I had to put my own hands, true story church, put my own hands on my head and I said, God, deliver me right now in Jesus' name. Let my thoughts be at peace. Let my mind be at peace. Let my sleep be sweet. Oh God, that I can be able to hear you and hear you afresh. And let me tell you, I can, I can testify right now, some of those things that are on my mind, they seldom even pass through. And when they come, they just pass through. Because uh, I'm not grabbing them with my emotions. I'm not grabbing them with desires, but I'm grabbing Jesus. I'm reaching for Jesus every step of the way. And because I'm reaching for him, God is purifying my heart more and more every day. He's getting my heart ready for him. He's getting my mind ready for him. He's getting my body ready for his purpose and for sanctification. I thank him, Father, right now in Jesus' name, I give you praise, oh God. And I know that God will do it as we begin to commit our lives afresh to him. We need to move in our land like never before and if anybody's going to move it church the church is going to move it oh we got all these community folks and i thank god for them i want them to keep doing what they're doing mm. But I don't want the church to shirk its responsibility about being actively involved. And who's the church? We are the church. And we need to be actively involved in what in the affairs that govern our city. Because God wants us to know it's our city. And as we pray, the Bible tells us if we pray for the rulers, he said, I'm going to let you live a quiet and peaceable play, place right here in the earth realm. Are we living that now? We're not living that now. But God said if we really sincerely pray that that's what will happen. And so I thank God right now that there's some righteous folks that are receiving this word right now. And we're going to commit differently to prayer and also to, to fasting. And so that authority now must be coupled with faith. And as we do, what happens when we begin to cultivate our faith? As we read the word, it's like we're, we're, we're digging up some stuff. You know, as we continue to pray and read the word and we're singing our worship songs, we're digging up some stuff. We're putting more space now for, for the word of God, more space now for faith to grow grow. And what happens is it begins to germinate and it doesn't just grow like this all at once, but it's growing more and more. We're building our spiritual muscles. You know, some of us pride ourselves in our time in the gym. We pride ourselves on how strong we are. We pride ourselves on how many pounds we can lift. Oh, but how much power can you lift? How much prayer can you lift? How much of the things of God can we lift? How, how can we move some things out of the way so that people all around us can be free? It's time for us to be devoted to God like never before. And you see, when we become disappointed, it's because we have trusted in ourselves. Mm, back to the disciples. They were disappointed because they thought they should have been able to do it. Rather than recognizing that the power was of God and things must be done God's way. See, why didn't we do it? Why didn't I do it? I wanted to do it. I wanted to lay hands. I wanted to pray. I wanted to, I wanted to sing that song. Why didn't I? It's not really about I when it comes to the kingdom. It is about God 
and it is about the kingdom. It is about we. It is about all of us. And so that which we do, it is not territorialism. It is not isolationism. It is not separatism. But God is looking for a united church. He prayed. Jesus prayed. Lord, let them be one just like we are one. And so God wants us to pray and pray diligently. And then we look in the book of Isaiah. Before we leave, I must share this with you. Isaiah 58, it's about our fasting. Uh, as some of us, we can't probably recall the last time we fasted, the last time we pushed away food. I'm talking about food right now. Uh, we pushed away a plate or a meal or a, a time just to kind of hear God and get along with God. But I want you to hear what Isaiah prophesies in this 58th chapter. And then after today, I want you to read this chapter on your own. And he begins to talk about their worship. And he says, you know, they're crying. I'm reading now in verse number two, the latter part of verse two, New Living Translation. They asked me to take action on their behalf. And that we're asking God to do it. We're asking God, Lord, take action on behalf of our community. Take action on behalf of what we're trying to accomplish here in our city, in our nation. He said, you asked me to take action, but pretending that they want to be near me. Pretending. He says, we have fasted before you, they say. But God, why aren't you impressed? We've been fasting. God, why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. And then, then he responds, I will tell you why. It is because you are fasting to please yourselves. Because even while you're fasting, you keep oppressing your workers. While we're fasting, we're still being negative. While we're fasting, we're still causing division. While we're fasting, we're still downgrading our brothers and sisters. While we're fasting, we're still cursing and, and saying pe profane things. We're doing all of this while we are fasting. And read the rest of that. I'm not going to read it to you, but please read the rest of it. But I do want to go to verse number six. And, and Isaiah says, no, this is the kind of fasting I want. What kind of fasting does he want? This is the kind of fasting. We're not fasting to get that new car. We're not fasting to get that house. We're not fasting for a better job. He said, this is the kind of fast that Jesus is concerned about. He said, this is the kind that he wants in verse number six. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Don't be a slave driver, even in your home. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains of blind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. This is why we fast. Give clothes to those who need them. Do not hide from those relatives who need your help. And if we fast for the reasons that are outlined in this text, which is what we need in our land today, because everything that Isaiah prophesies about, we can see it right now in the year 2020. And when we do that, he says, then your salvation, and that word in this particular text is translated deliverance from whatever you need to be delivered from, whatever demonic force is holding us back. Your deliverance will come like the dawn and your wounds will heal quickly because many of us are walking around wounded. Feelings have been hurt. People have been offended. You didn't like the way you were, you were treated. You were faced with rejection, but those wounds as you fast, hallelujah, for the right reason, God said, I'm going to heal those wounds. And somebody right now, you're, you're, you're grieving, you're upset, you're distraught because of the way you have been treated. But as you fast for these things that Isaiah is outlining here, God said, those wounds I'm going to heal. Because you know what? We don't want you on the front line wounded. We don't want you firing battles, fighting battles out of your woundedness. We want you fighting out of your love for people, out of your love for unity, out of your love for our city, out of your love for peace, out of your love for the mind of God, out of your love for everybody. Because I don't care what color people are. God wants us to love everybody. And yes, she said everybody. So your wounds will heal quickly. Your godliness will lead you forward. Mm, your godliness will lead you forward. Not your emotions, not what you think. Not the way you believe you should respond after being insulted, but your godliness will lead you forward. And the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call on the Lord, he will answer. What will he say? He'll say, yes, I'm here. 
he will quickly reply. God wants us to get involved. And today our message is to get involved with prayer and fasting. Push back that plate. I have a few of them here in my kitchen. Push back that plate and get along with God. Hear the mind of God. Draw close to him yourself so that you can be a vessel that God can use. You see, I can't really help somebody else if I've got bitterness and I've got jealousy and I've got envy in my own heart. And so I've got to clean all that stuff out because I can't take that to the, to the front line. And I believe that God is calling the church. I feel the Holy Ghost right now and I declare it in Jesus' name. The church is advancing to the front line because we are purifying our hearts. We are praying and we are fasting and we are believing God for the breakthrough. It's time for us to move forward in the things of the kingdom. It's time for us to do it God's way. And God's way is by prayer and fasting. Hallelujah. Daniel prayed for 21 days. And, and the Bible tells us that God heard him the first time. But there was all kind of spiritual warfare keeping the blessing back. But it finally came because he never relented. Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. King Jehoshaphat and the people fasted because they realized the, the battle now was the Lord's. Even last week, I talked about Esther, and she got all her maids fasting. It's time for us to add something to our prayer. And if you're not praying, please start praying. But let's add something to it. Let's pray and fast that our land might be healed. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you today. Remember that we are New Zion Tabernacle. We are the church seeking the heart of God, and it's our desire to share God's heart to our community. Remember that you can give by way of Givelify, also NewZionTabernacle.org. But just before we go, let me just pray a brief word of prayer. Uh, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. We thank you, O oh God, for this time. We thank you for sharing, O oh God, your great love and for your power. We thank you for the reminder mm, to pray and to fast. These, thought, these things only come that kind of way. The spirit of racism, we call it down right now in Jesus' name. And we agree with the mind and the word of God that it shall never stick its head up again. We declare it by the power of the cross. God, in Jesus' name, bless the church. Let her rise up, God, and be that vessel that you need us to be. Let us cry aloud and continue to spare not the word of God, the truth. People need to know the truth. So, God, in Jesus' name, I ask you to bless our community, bless our nation. Heal, oh God, every area of injustice, every area of inequality right now by the power of the blood. Do it for us even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. Mm. And because he has already gone to Calvary, we can go forth in peace. Thank you for joining us for worship. We hope that you were blessed by today's message. To stay in contact with New Zion Tabernacle, please follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and on YouTube. If you would like to sow a financial seed, please feel free to download the Givelify app either in your App Store or your Google Play Store and search New Zion Tabernacle. Feel free to join us for worship every Sunday, 11 a.m. Our address is 1835 Spring Street, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46808. We look forward to seeing you in the sanctuary. Until next time, be blessed.